Good morning, everyone. All right, so this is Hot Topics in Government. Um, thanks to all of you for sticking with us. This is our last panel of the day. Um, thanks, of course, to VMI for hosting this wonderful conference. I don't know about you, but I certainly learned a lot. Um, so I'm Angela Navarro. I am the Deputy Secretary of Natural Resources under Governor Northam. You'll hear from the other Deputy Secretary in my office um, in just a little bit. Um, but the panel that we have today is a wonderful panel. It's government officials from both the state government and local government, and there certainly is no dearth of hot topics right now in the natural resources space. Um, we heard from Governor Northam yesterday uh, that he laid out six key priority natural resource uh, areas that our administration will be focusing on. They include clean water, clean air, clean energy, resilience to climate change. We heard a great speech this morning about climate resilience, environmental justice, and sustainable resource use and access. Um, and each of these speakers will talk on some of those key issues, but collectively will hit all six of those issues. So we're gonna kick things off with Joe Lurch. Um, he will provide the local government perspective. Joe is the Director of Local Government Policy at the Virginia Association of Counties. He's worked as a planner for the cities of Fairfax and Richmond and Spotsylvania County. He also served as a planning commissioner for the city of Fredericksburg. Previously, Joe served as the Director of Environmental Policy for the Virginia Municipal League and was a secretary and treasurer for the Virginia Energy Purchasing Governmental Association. So he's got a lot of experience to bring to this. So join me in welcoming Joe Lurch. Good morning. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, one of the things that Angela talked about was uh, government officials. Um, you know, I'm actually not a government official. Um, I am actually uh, a policy uh, person for the Virginia Association of Counties, which represents um, all the counties in Virginia. We do a lot of uh, advocacy work, lobbying at the state level, a little bit at the federal level. Um, we do a lot of education and outreach for our members. Um, and what I'm, the topic I'm going to talk on you today, and I'm really going to focus in on one a hot environmental topic for our members, and it has to do with large-scale solar um, installations. And, and the reason it's become a, a, such a hot topic is we're seeing a plethora of applications um, across the Commonwealth. And to give you an, a, an idea of what we're talking about, um, if you just look at the permit by rule for solar facilities that's on the DEQ website. And how many here are familiar with the PBR solar? Okay, so a lot of you are. There's actually been 71 notices of intent, NOIs, uh, over 40 counties and two cities. And this is more than 29,000 acres being proposed for solar, uh, large-scale utility solar. And I know some people like to call them solar farms. Um, I think we prefer to call them what they really are, which is their, their power plants. They're, it's not farming, um, but this is having an impact in many of our communities. Uh, to give you an idea of what we're talking about, um, one megawatt, one megawatt of solar uh, takes up anywhere from eight to 12 acres of land, so it has a big land use impact. Um, beyond just what's in the PBR queue, there are other applications that go through other processes, whether it's through the SEC or other processes through the state. Um, there was actually a Dominion executive last summer at the Commission on uh, Electric Utility Regulation that, that told that commission that they expect to see 40,000 acres in solar of this type uh, in the coming uh, next decades. So it, it begs the question, why are we seeing this big influx? Uh, and when I talked about the, the PBRQ, you know, those are applications going from November of 2014 all the way till January of 2018. I would say fully half of those have happened within, almost within the last year and a half. So it's really ramped up uh, as we're going forward. Uh, you know, I've identified four, four big reasons. Um, one was actually the PBR legislation itself back in 2009 that the General Assembly adopted. Um, and what that did was, is if you were doing a solar or a wind project and you were up to 100 megawatts um, in, in delivering capacity, you didn't have to go through the SCC. You didn't have to get a certificate of public need. You could go through the permit by rule process through DEQ. And since so many of, of you seem to be familiar with it, I won't touch on it too much, but essentially what you need is, is three things. One, you need to, to show that there's no environmental impacts um, with this application. The other thing um, is you need to show that you know, there's no impacts to historic resources. 
And if you can also show that you have approval from the local government um, for the land use application, and you've ameliorated any of those impacts through the review by um, both DEQ and, and DCR and their natural heritage resources, um, then you can get this permit. It's essentially a letter that says you can go ahead and build this project. So that happened in 2009, and in fact, um, just two sessions ago in the General Assembly, they actually upped it to 150 megawatts. And originally, when it was done in 2009, it was meant uh, just for these independent power producers, the incumbent utilities, uh, you know, Dominion and APCO, could not take advantage of this process. But when they upped it to 150 megawatts, they also made it uh, available to the IOUs. Um, then in the second reason why I think we're seeing a lot of these, in 2012, FERC, the Federal Energy uh, Regulatory Commission, came up with different standards, um, loosened standards, I I'd say, or, or not as strict standards, for interconnection into the grid for projects um, up to 20 megawatts in size. And in fact, when you go to the PBR website and you look at all these notices of intent, you'll see a lot of applications right at that 20 megawatt threshold. Uh, because that's just part of, of the economics of it with these uh, new standards. Uh, another big thing, um, and I'll touch on that uh, probably in a little more detail as, as I talk about some of these issues, was in 2014, um, the General Assembly actually approved um, a, 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 a tax incentive, albeit a local tax incentive. Um, I sometimes like to joke that, uh, you know, the General Assembly loves tax incentives at the local level, but not at the state. Uh, that they like to grant. Um, and it was one, actually, in all honesty, the previous year it had, it, it had gone, you know, as a bill, and both VACO and I was at VML at the time you know, argued against the bill. We said, look, it's already a local option to provide tax incentives for renewable energy equipment. You shouldn't make this a mandate. But the General Assembly went ahead and did that. Um, they've modified it uh, somewhat in 2016, and I can touch on that um, when I talk about that issue on, on taxation uh, at a later point. So that was, I think, a big turning point. But I think the fourth reason, and probably the biggest reason, is the corporate desire, and we're talking Fortune 500 companies, to purchase renewal, renewable energy from the grid and, and where they get that. And it's part of this, this commitment. And you've seen it um, with a lot of companies, um, Pepsi, Facebook, Google, Amazon. And in fact, you know, the first actual uh, solar uh, installation, large-scale uh, large utility to be built in Virginia is on the eastern shore in Accomack, and that's 80 megawatts, and that's power that's being purchased uh, through the grid, as I understand, through some sort of agreement. I don't understand the, the details of it for, for Amazon. And in fact, um, there's now um, a proposal that's actually, it's so big it, it can't even go through the PBR process. It's going through the SCC. It's for 500 megawatts in Spotsylvania County. Um, and to give you an idea of the scale, and I saw this uh, just yesterday on a map um, of how much land this takes up in western Spotsylvania, and I used to work in Spotsylvania, so I kind of have an understanding of, of the scale. It, it's pretty massive. It's more than 3,500 acres that are going to be converted. Now, to give you an idea of, of, of scale, that's 5.4 square miles. The city of Lexington is 2.5 square miles. So take the area of the city of Lexington, double it, and you're putting in that type of, of large-scale utility. So as you can um, understand, for, for counties, this is an issue that they're grappling with uh, through their land use processes. And I think that's probably the biggest issue. Um, you know, several years ago, you know, I heard grumblings from some in the industry, uh, the, the solar industry, that they wanted to see more streamlined um, approval processes at the local level. Um, they wanted to see that, you know, a developer putting in one of these installations can expect the same treatment wherever they go. Um, we argued against it, um, and, and part of the reason is this is like any other big land use. You know, it could be a rock quarry, it could be an airport, whatever it is in, in a county or a city, and you need to go through the processes, and the citizens need to have the input. Um, and that's what's critical, I think, um, about um, this, this type of process, is, is getting that input from the citizens. Taxation, um, that's another big issue. I talked about the, um, the tax incentive, and I'll, I'll talk about a little more detail. Essentially, what they did in 2014 was they said anything 20 megawatts or less, and this is the General Assembly, is exempt from all um, local uh, property taxation, which is essentially 
what's known as the machine and tools tax, the M&T tax. Anybody ever heard M&T before? Okay, several of you. It's a source of local revenue and it's important um, for, for many localities. Um, and it's actually something that um, is, is more of an incentive at the local rev revenue um, for industries uh, than your regular personal property at the local level because a lot of them, uh, they decline over time. They're a lot lower than your regular personal property. So it's an incentive that even localities have, but it fully exempts them up to 20 acres. That was modified in 2016 to say anything five acres or less gets the 100% exemption from local M&T. Um, anything over five megawatts gets an 80% exemption from M&T. Um, that's a big impact, um, I think, to many of the localities as they consider these applications. Now, some of the things that are, are nuances with this M&T tax is typically what we're seeing is agricultural land being converted to these solar installations and prime agricultural land. And the reason is pretty simple for this. It's usually your, your flattest piece and your, your, your best draining piece of land. So that's just, the, you know, just kind of the economics of it. I think uh, another thing that you're seeing um, in certain areas is you're seeing um, families that have had farmland for generations, but they no longer live there. They're leasing it out to farmers. And then the developer comes along and says, hey, look, I'll put you in a 30 to 35 year lease. I'll pay you probably five, maybe even 10 times more than you're getting on your agricultural rent. So that's a big incentive for some of these landowners. Um, if you have farm, um, land in farm use or timber, many localities have what's known as land use valuation and they tax it at a lower rate. So if it switches over to this type of, of um, use, it then gets taxed at a commercial rate, which is actually higher than the agricultural use. So that somewhat may offset the loss, potential loss in um, uh, M&T revenue. Um, some localities don't have land use valuation, so that's, that's an issue that they're considering. I think a third issue that we're starting to see more is the issue of stormwater impacts um, and related through uh, the construction process, both during the construction process and then post-construction. I mean, you could take just this case of the, the Spotsylvania one. I mean, you're talking 3,500 acres in, in solar panels on what has predominantly been forest, and a lot of it has been clear-cut, as I understand. And just talking to Spotsylvania officials yesterday, they think it's the intent of the developer to actually just burn that um, over a four-month period to make way for the solar panels. Of course, they may be a bit premature because I don't know if the actual, um, uh, if they'll get actual approval. They have to go through the special use permit process. And in some localities, they're having so many of these applications. Um, Halifax and Mecklenburg, they've gotten five to six um, easily. And so now they're looking at hiring staff just to deal, full-time staff, two to three persons in some of these localities just to deal with the stormwater issue during the construction phase and then post-construction. Um, you gotta imagine all these solar panels, it's not a pervious surface, so where does this water all go? And talking to some of the developers, they're running into issues of getting those approvals um, at the local level, and they would like to see an actual expedited process, whether the state steps in or the localities uh, work with the state in doing this. So those are kind of the, the big um, issues that I wanted to touch on on what I think is a hot topic, at least for counties in, in, in many rural areas. I know that um, one thing that uh, VECA would like to see is maybe having a look at the PBR process, a couple of things that we've identified that, that maybe could tweak to make it better and, and to make it better for all. One is there's, I, I don't think there's necessarily adequate fees for that process to actually get the adequate staffing for DEQ to review all these things. Um, the second thing is they just get a letter and they're good to go. There's no time limit on getting started. There's no expiration. Um, in a, many of these 71 NOIs, we're wondering how many of them will actually be built and, and are people just being speculative because the process is so easy to get the approval. Um, so those are some of the things, ho hopefully, in, in the coming years um, we, can, we can look at and work with the state on. So that's all I wanted to talk on, and I'll be glad to take Q&A when we uh, get the panel back up. Thank you.
Well, I think Joe raised a lot of really important issues. Obviously, there are some significant public policy goals around clean energy and the growth of the solar market, but um, a lot of question marks around land use issues and how you sustainably make those investments. So we'll certainly dig into that more in the Q&A. Next up, we have David Paler. David is the director of the Department of Environmental Quality, and he was first appointed to this position by Governor Tim Kaine in 2006. Previous to this, he served as Deputy Secretary of Natural Resources under Governor Warner. He began his career in 1973 with the State Water Control Board, where he served, and then he later served in various roles at DEQ, um, including aquatic ecologist, water resources manager, director of petroleum programs, and director of operations. So obviously, a wealth of information and knowledge. Uh, so join me in welcoming Dave. Thanks, Angela, and thanks, everyone. Um, I've, got, I've said this before. I'm going to have to get that uh, start date out of my resume because uh, <laughs> it scares me. <laughs> uh, and I was tempted to say uh, uh, a pass. Uh, we don't have any hot topics at DEQ. <laughs> but I'll go ahead and start with the elephant in the room, and that's pipelines. Um, you heard um, Secretary Strickler uh, the other night and, and, uh, and the governor yesterday. Um, the pipeline issue uh, is a huge issue, and it really, um, you know, it concerns, it scares um, a whole lot of people. There's a whole lot of information out there, um, some of it right, some of it wrong. Um, DEQ only has a slice of the... Um, uh, of the piece uh, related to pipeline installation, and, and that's the water quality piece. Uh, there are a whole lot of pieces of it that we do not have. Um, we believe, we are confident, as the governor said uh, yesterday, that we have done um, more in the um, regulatory oversight of these uh, pipelines than has ever been done, m maybe in the country, certainly in, in the Commonwealth. Um, and, um, and that continues to be um, a subject of some debate. Um, but we have um, worked closely with the Corps um, on stream crossings. We have, um, uh, we have state requirements as part of the Corps requirements and stream crossings. Uh, we have, um, I guess the most important thing about it is the 401 Uplands certification, which is a thing that hasn't been done before, and it basically puts water quality requirements on the entire length of the pipeline. That's above and beyond what we're legally required to do and what we have done in the past. And a big piece of that is the stormwater controls and the erosion and sediment uh, controls. Um, we're actually, uh, normal SOP would, would be that, um, uh, that you file Andrew's standards, annual standards and specs, you get those approved. It's a general statement of how you're going to do business and you go on. Um, and we've got that, but we've also um, are requiring um, detailed oversight um, of all the plan sheets for every uh, foot of that pipeline uh, to control sediment, to control runoff, especially on high slopes, to make sure that you stabilize the steep slopes and things like that. When you heard the governor yesterday say that the Mountain Valley pipeline ha had finally been approved, uh, that, me that was a reference to the fact that those plan sheets uh, for stormwater, post and pre and post construction stormwater, and for um, um, uh, and for erosion and sediment control um, ha have finally met the, met the standard. We have uh, hired a consultant um, um, at some significant expense to, um, to oversee um, all of those plan sheets and make that sure that they're all exactly right before, um, before they go forward. Uh, and, and MVP only has 100 miles. Um, ACP's got 300 miles. It's taken a little bit longer. Um, uh, but we are, um, uh, and, and that is um, a, a level of scrutiny that ENS has never had before. Um, then, then the next question is if they're approved, um, when they're approved, um, compliance. 
Uh, we are also hiring a contractor um, to have two people um, on every active site, uh, spread site um, at all times uh, to, to have eyes on the ground for what's going on. Uh, we would have drones, but uh, we're not allowed to have drones by law. Uh, but, um, you know, the, um, uh, the, the um, interest community, as, um, as um, uh, the folks that, that are concerned about this, um, are able to have drones, and they've got an initiative called CSI. I'm not sure what it stands for, but uh, uh, probably citizen something inspections. But, uh, but anyway, we've met with them, and, and we're going to be linked up with them as well. We're going to have eyes on this thing all the time. Uh, we're going to do our level best to make sure that um, uh, that installation is completely um, uh, according to uh, to standards. And as the governor said yesterday, we uh, now have new uh, stop work order authority. Um, if there is any reason that we have to do that, uh, I am also confident that we have the attention of the uh, uh, of both project uh, uh, both projects and that they. Um, have um, every intention to work with us to install them well to, from the outset. So that's, uh, that's my defense of what we've done on pipelines. Coal ash, um, uh, it hadn't been as much in the news, but the governor mentioned it again yesterday. Um, the short version of that is there's been a lot of concern about uh, uh, groundwater impacts um, from legacy coal ash ponds um, and what's the best way to close them out. We had been on a path to close them out according to federal regulations and, and some state regulations. Uh, folks um, in the legislature and otherwise have said, ah, we're not sure that's good enough. Uh, maybe we'd like to look for another alternative. Um, and that search for another alternative um, from a policy standpoint continues uh, in the form of um, the latest legislation uh, will require um, uh, Dominion to um, uh, to go out and solicit um, proposals from folks for recycling, for clean closure, and some other things, and, and to have that um, to the legislature by this fall. Um, that'll give us uh, more information about costs and benefits uh, of the different options so that, um, so that a policy option can, uh, decision can be made uh, by the legislature and, and others about um, what's the best way to, uh, to close these uh, ponds out. The ones that are um, already slated to be clean closed, excavated and taken off site, um, uh, can go ahead and be, um, be permitted and, and move in that process. And that's gonna also uh, give us an opportunity to, um, uh, to make sure that we're collecting the groundwater data that we need to collect to see what needs to be done there. So that's where coal ash is. Um, the um, uh, carbon regulations. Uh, if you were here uh, early in the session, you heard uh, Mike Dowd talk about uh, the proposal for us to join uh, the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative. Uh, that would put um, uh, uh, carbon caps uh, on um, our electric generating units uh, and it would, um, uh, it would allow for trading for, for multi-state trading. Um, one thing that is unique in, in our proposal is it would we would use a consignment auction, which means, I'm not gonna explain it in detail, but it means the revenues um, for, um, for the uh, carbon credits that, uh, that are uh, assigned uh, to each of our utilities, those revenues come back to the utilities uh, with the idea that they are um, uh, then rebated uh, to customers to reduce rates. Uh, so we, th that regulation is moving along um, and um, uh, with a goal right now uh, of having us uh, be a member of, uh, of Reggie and entering into the first auction in 2020. Last year you heard me talk about um, uh, groundwater, um, coastal groundwater, the uh, large coastal aquifer east of 95 and the fact that uh, We've lost several hundred feet of head over the last 50 years and we've got to do something or, or we'll eventually drain the thing. And um, the 14 largest uh, permitted uh, users of that um, aquifer have worked with us um, to reduce uh, their uh, withdrawal uh, by over 50% over the next 10 years. 
um, computer models tell us that that alone would, would stabilize the aquifer, all other things being equal, all other things aren't equal. Uh, and so we um, had one piece of legislation uh, that passed this year that, um, uh, that encouraged uh, subdivisions to uh, uh, evaluate options for uh, uh, groundwater use. And, and we're going to want to, I think, continue to look for other things that we can do to make sure that we preserve that uh, aquifer long term. An internal goal that we've got is, um, I'll just call it external communications. Uh, being uh, more responsive, more um, more social media savvy. Um, I'm probably too old now to be social media savvy. Uh, not personally at risk of uh, Facebook having stolen my data because um, I don't have a Facebook account. But um, uh, but we, we, we there's some challenges as an agency with using tw uh, Twitter and using some of those other things. But it is also the way that. Um, society is communicating more and more and and uh, we need to be um, timely and responsive in getting messages out to the public um, so that so that we can be a part of the discussion before it's moved on to the next thing and so that's the thing that we're going to be looking at and then maybe the last thing i'll mention um, is the governor announced an executive order uh, yesterday um, it really is an opportunity for us um, uh, this governor is absolutely committed um, to natural resources. Uh, early in the, uh, b before, um, uh, well, a, a year ago, while he was just starting his campaign, I had um, some discussions with uh, Clark Mercer, who's now his chief of staff, and he was asking, uh, what, um, uh, how much money have y'all lost? How, how much staff have y'all lost in all of these budget cuts? Uh, and it's some big numbers. Um, and I've told people many times, uh, every time there's been a budget, over my entire career, every time there's been a budget cut, um, uh, there has never been a restoration later when revenues rebounded. Uh, so we've continued to shrink and shrink and shrink, and that's the thing um, that concerns um, this governor, um, did even before he was elected. And, um, and so he's asking us to give him a, sort of a sweeping look at what are our responsibilities, um, what are our resources? Uh, what, what ought we to be doing that we don't have the resources to do right now? And he wants to take a comprehensive look at all of that uh, for, um, uh, to, to make some decisions about how he can help us. Uh, I think the word he used was revitalize, uh, recover, whatever. And uh, boy, I gotta tell you, that's uh, uh, really refreshing news to us. Um, uh, and we're going to work with him and, and hope that uh, uh, that we can uh, begin to do uh, more things that uh, that the public expects of us, uh, and um, and and do uh, be more more efficient, more targeted, more focused on the things that really matter. So um, we will be, um, I think, looking to the public for some input on that as well as we move along. And I'm really excited uh, about that opportunity that's coming along. So with that, I'll look forward to taking your questions later. Thanks. All right. Well, we're certainly excited about that executive order as well. And it's pretty amazing the work and all of the hot topics that DEQ covers given um, the resource deficits that they've faced over the years. So next, we are moving into the PowerPoint presentation portion of um, this wonderful panel and we're going to start with Clyde Christman. So Clyde is the director of the Department of Conservation and Recreation. He has served in this position since April of 2014. Clyde has more than 30 years of experience in budgeting, strategic planning, human resource management, and oversight of various state and local government programs, including serving as legislative fiscal analyst for the General Assembly Senate Finance Committee, as Deputy Secretary of Public Safety, and as Director of the Virginia Department of Charitable Gaming. So I'm going to start Clyde's presentation and well, join me in welcoming Clyde. Thank you, Angela. <clears throat> Good morning. So all week I've been watching people up here. If you don't notice, there's this bright light shining in your eyes, so I came prepared. <laughs> now if I can see my slides. <laughs> so good morning, uh, and it's great to be here uh, again this year at Environment Virginia. This is my 17th year coming to Environment Virginia in my various capacities, and I always find it to be uh, 
a great time in the spring to rejuvenate, get a lot of good thoughts, uh, a lot of good ideas and moving forward. So talking about some hot topics, uh, one of the most important hot topics on my radar is hopefully the General Assembly passes a budget because a lot of the things I'm gonna talk to you about are, are contingent on, on what's in now, now known as House Bill, Senate Bill 5002 that used to be uh, House Bill and Senate Bill 30 that uh, unfortunately got left behind when the General Assembly left the town. But uh, it, for just a quick overview of the agency uh, proposed in FY19 for the department is a total budget of about $129.5 million. As you see the breakout there, about 74 of that is general fund. Uh, you notice the difference between the general fund from FY19 to uh, FY20, uh, and the bulk of that is the water quality improvement fund that I will be talking to you about shortly. Uh, we are currently approved for 451 positions. However, due to budget cuts, only 425 of those are filled. So I was encouraged as well when I heard uh, Governor Northam's remarks yesterday because of, uh, as David said, with these, these were positions that we have authorized that we don't have funding for due to uh, previous budget cuts. Uh, and I'm hopeful that we can uh, uh, try to get some of these more critical positions back filled with the agency. Also, this is a time of year where we're hiring feverishly, and by the end of this month, we'll have swelled from our year-round wage staff of about 640 uh, to over 1,600, um, including all of our state park and natural heritage seasonal staff. And we have a bulk of federal grants. Last year, and when I did the Hot Topics, this was one of concern for us because you might recall at that point in time, we weren't quite sure what Congress was going to do with the budget. But as you see, uh, we are very dependent on federal funding for a lot of the programs that we provide. So Virginia Land Conservation Foundation is, is one of the hot topics I want to talk to you about. Um, Governor Northam mentioned yesterday, and you will be hearing more about this later this month during the vault conference and be held in Roanoke April 23rd through 25th. Um, looking at the Virginia Land Conservation Foundation started looking at a more strategic way to approach how we are providing the limited resources we have for land conservation. You see on this slide what is proposed in the introduced budget. Uh, both the House and Senate took significant cuts to this in part because of some of the mitigation money that we've been uh, working with. Uh, but uh, to us it's important that we continue with our, our base budget funding and not go backwards. So. Um, hopefully, we, we'll see where this ends up at the end of the General Assembly session. The, uh, the, the House zeroed out the first year, but provided full funding in the second year. The Senate cut $3 million each year, leaving us only $1.5 million. But the Virginia Land Conservation Foundation has been very, very busy in the fall of 2017, the busiest I have ever seen it. Uh, we had our normal board meeting in September where we awarded uh, $4.26 million in grants to 23 projects. And then we had two special meetings in November, uh, one dealing with the Surrey Skiffs Creek's uh, power line settlement funds and the other with the DuPont uh, Mercury settlement. And I'm going to talk a little bit more detail about each of those. Um, the Surrey Skiffs Creek mitigation uh, project, we had $12.5 million to support projects in the Jamestown Island, Hog Island, Captain John Smith uh, Trail Historic Different, uh, District and the James River watershed. We had some great applications awarded about $12.4 million to nine projects, and those projects are all it's really exciting because Governor Northam is going to get the opportunity to do some neat ribbon cuttings here coming up in the near future. So you will be seeing more about this in the coming months. Um, in addition, the DuPont settlement that I'm sure uh, many of you have read and heard about in the newspaper, one of the largest um, environmental settlements ever, um, and be, uh, as a result of that, we had $19.5 million. This was a little bit different process because under this settlement, the Secretary of Natural Resources and the U.S. Uh, Fish and Wildlife Service are the, are the trustees of this settlement. So in this case, uh, the Land Conservation Foundation actually served as the body to make recommendations to the trustees. And at the end of the day, most of the, uh, most of the uh, projects were accepted. However, there were some minor adjustments made, but, made. but again, you will be hearing more because a lot of these uh, projects will be coming to fruition in the coming uh, weeks and months. Um, Switching gears, I want to talk a little bit about our Agricultural Best Management Practices Program. One of the things that we have been extremely focused on at DCR is livestock stream exclusion, a pro practice that we know is technically is SL6, which basically is a suite of practices that starts with fencing the livestock out of the streams. Um, beginning in, in FY 2014, a decision was made prior to my tenure to provide 100% cost share for these projects. and. Um, 
and as a result of that, there was a two-year sign-up period for FY14 and FY15, and at one point in time, we had millions and millions of dollars in backlog. The good news is we're down to under $10 million in backlog, uh, going back to the, the FY15 sign-up, but the results have been phenomenal. Since 2013, we have had $76 million in, in projects, over 2,000 practices finished, 7.8 million linear feet of of streams in the Commonwealth that have been fenced out and protected, over 96,000 animals that are now fenced out of the streams, and we have an additional $20 million in play right now in projects that have been approved, 314 projects that are currently underway. And so we hope to be able to continue uh, with funding that we will have uh, coming to us. Speaking of which, in the uh, introduced budget, the Water Quality Improvement Act uh, provided $22.5 million. This is the funding that comes from the 10% surplus uh, from state agency balances and the 10% of, gen of general fund uh, unobligated uh, agency balances in addition to the uh, surplus revenue. And those of you that were in the state budgeting seminar yesterday, you heard Jim Reginald, Reginball predict that we should have a pretty sizable deposit at the end of this fiscal year based on relatively conservative revenue forecast. We certainly hope so. Uh, in addition, Jim mentioned the $10 million in non-general fund appropriation from the recordation fee. Unfortunately, that's been a little soft. It's been coming in more like about $8 million or so. But uh, what is proposed in the introduced budget, and the good news is that both the House and the Senate had approved this uh, in their versions of the budget, so we're pretty confident that this is what we'll see at the end of the uh, session. About $26.2 million will be available for agricultural best management practices next fiscal year. Um, and that, that will provide three and a half, in, additional to, in addition to that, three and a half million dollars for technical assistance to our soil and water districts, uh, two million dollars going into the Water Quality Improvement Fund Reserve, um, and then you see some other smaller items. I wanted to just give you a snapshot of a 10-year history of the Water Quality Improvement Fund. We have had two, over $285 million going back to 2009, fiscal year 2009, and you see the sort of the annual breakout. What's interesting about this slide, if you look at it, is that the appropriation amount in the center column is all over the board. Uh, but as you see, the actual distribution is a little bit more stable than that. Uh, um, because of the fact that, uh, as I like to say, if we could just get the farmers to harvest their crops on June 30th at the end of the fiscal year, we wouldn't have this lag, but uh, we continue to. And I note that the year-to-date figure uh, for this year, uh, we're about $12 million. We're, we're well over that now, but as we, as the, fund, the information comes in from the districts and we upload it. But, you know, we have put uh, over two, $260 million in agricultural best management practices on the ground in the last 10 years. I'll caveat that by telling you that the Code of Virginia requires us to do a needs assessment working with the stakeholders in order to meet our Chesapeake Bay goals and our needs assessment says that this number needs to be about 110 million dollars a year so good news and bad news there Swip switching gears quickly on a very positive thing we're working on our dam safety inventory uh, prior to uh, today uh, we were using an access database to maintain uh, all of the information on over 2100 regulated dams in Virginia uh, I don't know how many of you are familiar with Access personally, I, I hate it, I, I don't even know how to open it anymore, but uh, we have now gone to an online database. Um, we're in phase one of that now where the database has been designed and we're uploading the information on over 2,100 dams in Virginia. Many of them do not make, meet current safety standards. And one reason why this is important as we move to phase two is that our, our goal is that at the emergency operations center, if we have a severe storm event that threatens uh, some dam failures, that we're able to have real-time information at the state EOC and also for local emergency responders. Another good benefit of this new of this phase two of this program is that the dam owners, which everybody from you know, homeowners associations to local governments to soil and water districts, will actually be able to apply online, pay their fees online, and upload their information. Uh, so hopefully it will help us to improve. We're actually moving into the 21st century in our dam safety program. Real quickly on floodplain management, this is a big issue for us. Um, we are required to uh, keep an updated Commonwealth floodplain management plan. And the last time it was updated was in 2005. Uh, this is one of those things that went by the way of the budget cuts because by 2010, the staff that did this no longer uh, were funded and we and by 2000 and uh, uh, 
2015 when it should have been updated again. The, those staff had been five years gone. So, uh, we're, but we're happy that we're trying, we're getting this back on track now, and we'll be able to move forward on that. Switching gears quickly to talk about our state parks. So here's the good news. Um, uh, according to a very recently released report from Virginia Tech uh, Pamplin College of Business, uh, they found that in 2017, visitors spent over $226 million in the Commonwealth of Virginia uh, while visiting state parks. And what's most fascinating about that is 46% of that is from out of state. That's $104 million in in money that's coming to this economy in Virginia from out-of-state visitors. And you heard the governor talk yesterday about the importance of, uh, of us moving our economy forward with eco-based tourism. And our state parks are an important part of that, uh, over 10 million visits last year. And total economic activity uh, estimated at three, over 304 million. And I like this fact in that with Fresh money, meaning that Virginia Tech has said that this is funds that would not be here were it not for the activities surrounding the state parks, that for every dollar of general fund tax revenue that's provided for state parks, we generate $13 of fresh money. I think that if I could make a personal investment in something like that, I certainly would. And so I hope that as the governor and the General Assembly move forward uh, towards that goal of increasing funding for natural resources, we can do some smart investing. Uh, real quickly, I uh, reported last year about Natural Bridge State Park had just opened. Um, our attendance through last year was over $180,000, and we, uh, I think we will eclipse $2 million in revenue in just that park alone uh, this year coming up. One of the challenges that we face because of the uh, in increased visitation in our state parks is we have a challenge where our parks are overcrowded, particularly in Northern Virginia area. Uh, it's not uncommon on holiday weekends that we have to shut the gate down uh, right before the, uh, you know, by, by 10 or 11 o'clock on a Saturday. And so we have several new state parks in offing. Uh, Wildwater is under construction now. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have any operating funding for it, but the, as you see there, uh, the facilities will be completed within the next year to year and a half. The Seven Bend State Park in Shenandoah County is under construction now with an anticipated opening in spring of 2019. Uh, Clinch River, we've been authorized by the General Assembly to move forward. We've acquired one of our first uh, anchor tracks, and then thanks to the Nature Conservancy's partnership, we're moving forward with providing other river access sites, and uh, we hope within the next couple years to have that done. One important thing to us in the budget as part of the Surrey Skiffs Creek mitigation, uh, mitigation, there was uh, $25 million set aside for a gateway to Wera Wacomico, and we have identified property that is currently uh, owned by the Conservation Fund. It is in the proposed, in, in the governor's introduced budget for the General Assembly to approve this. In effect, uh, Dominion will be funding the build out of phase one of the park, and our hope is that about a year from now, they'll be turning the key over to a brand new state park for us, in addition, it provides us $1.25 in initial operating costs. So that's real exciting. Finishing up, Joe, since 20 or 30 minutes ago, we're now up to 77 notices of intent um, on some 30,000 acres, and Dominion indicates could be 50,000. I mentioned this for two reasons as I wrap up here uh, as two emerging, emerging questions for us at DCR. We have several lands that have conservation easements on them that are proposed, that there are, are solar farms proposed for them. So we have a question as to how uh, easement written in 1970 uh, that excludes commercial activity, whether that intended for solar farms or not. So that's an issue we're looking at. And another really important issue that we're looking at is what goes underneath of these solar panels. The panels are up on poles off the ground. And what we don't want is a bunch of gravel because that becomes a an impervious surface. And so we are recommending and looking at some best management practices as some of these solar installations move forward uh, to provide native Virginia habitat that will include pollination, pollinators, supporting kind of, of, of activity. What you don't want is grass you have to mow because mowers throw rocks and rocks and solar panels don't work well together. So, um, so these are a couple uh, emerging questions relating to, to Joe's very good points as well. So uh, with that, I, I will uh, wrap up and I look forward to taking your questions. All right, so we have one more panelist, and actually I think Clyde had his sunglasses out because he's heading out to one of our state parks after this, right Clyde? Um, all right, so Ann Jennings is Deputy Secretary of Natural Resources for the Chesapeake Bay. She is my partner in the Secretariat. Prior to this appointment, she was the Virginia Director of the Chesapeake Bay Commission. She's also served as the Virginia Executive Director of the Chesapeake Bay Foundation and as a biologist with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. So please wel welcome Ann Jennings. Thank you. 
Good morning. Good morning. All right. Um, so it's, uh, it's a real honor for me to be up uh, on the stage uh, talking about uh, government hot topics. Um, in my years past attending uh, this conference, I would have been sitting with you all uh, in the audience. So it's a real pleasure for me to be up here. Um, if you're like me, you've uh, sat through uh, lots of very informative uh, and very effective and, and, and very good uh, presentations as we just had here and in the sessions prior uh, to this morning. And you've seen a lot of PowerPoints. Um, so I'm gonna let you off the hook a little bit. You're probably a little weary. Um, so what, I, what I'm gonna do is tell you what I need you to focus on, and that's my last slide. Um, so if you, if you let your mind wander, that's perfectly fine. Just focus on my last slide. And the reason why I want you to focus on it um, is, is you know, we are launching we are into the phase three watershed implementation plan uh, for the Chesapeake Bay restoration effort. And um, this effort is gonna take new energy, uh, new ideas, new thinking. Uh, the governor's office certainly doesn't have a monopoly on new ideas. So um, my last slide is my contact information and I will encourage you uh, to be a part of that effort, uh, to be engaged. Uh, so, the EPA approved uh, total maximum daily load for nitrogen, phosphorus, and sediment for the Chesapeake Bay back in um, uh, December of 2010, latter part of 2010. And in improving that TMDL, the, the Environmental Protection Agency also uh, approved uh, watershed implementation plans from each of the jurisdictions uh, dictating how or, or, or planning out how we would meet our 2025 goals. At the time, when that TMDL was developed, uh, EPA and the jurisdictions agreed that we would do a midpoint assessment. We would ch check in with ourselves in, in the midpoint 2017, give or take a year, uh, and in doing so, we would develop the third phase of the watershed implementation plan um, to guide us uh, to the end game, so to speak. When we do this, as we develop the WIP, it will in some ways look similar uh, to WIP 1 and WIP 2. And as you can see up on my slide, you know, we're gonna have targets for reducing nitrogen and phosphorus. We're gonna be evaluating our current authorities, programs, policies, funding, et cetera. Uh, we're gonna be looking at where the gaps are. Uh, we will be accounting for new growth. We're gonna be tracking and reporting implementation and, and developing contingencies. Uh, but that's, from my perspective, that's where the similarities are gonna, are gonna end. And, and what I'll offer to you is, is WIP 3 is not going to be your mother's WIP. Uh, we are going to be using new and improved tools, uh, new and improved planning tools, as well as implementation tools. Uh, we've got lots of new challenges that science is telling us we have, that we have to deal with. And we have the benefit of lots and lots of experience. So I'm going to run through these uh, quickly. Again, your mind can wander. Pay attention to the last slide. Um, but new challenges, or, or I'm sorry, new and improved tools, new and improved planning tools. So we are working with uh, phase six of the models that help us plan out this effort. Uh, and this is a slide that um, Rich Batuk was kind enough uh, to allow me to use. And what it, it's there to illustrate uh, to you all uh, that we, have, we really are getting it right. Um, this slide shows... The, the modeled water quality through the years of 85 to 2015. Um, this is on the Susquehanna, as well as the real data, uh, the in the water data. And you can see, hopefully fairly easily, um, that there's great consistency between the two. So we're using new models that'll help us plan out this, this effort moving forward. Uh, we also have uh, new data for land use and land cover. You, you've seen this slide. If you've been in uh, the other Chesapeake Bay sessions, uh, J James Davis Martin uh, uh, pointed to this in his presentation yesterday. And I'll just offer to you the second and fourth picture there. Uh, that's what we were using under WIP 1, 30 meter resolution land use land cover data. You see it's pretty fuzzy. It's like we were able to focus in 
Um, the first and third uh, photo up there is the one meter resolution land use land cover data. That's what we will be using uh, for uh, the, the phase three WIP. As I said, we will also be able to utilize uh, new and improved implementation tools. Uh, you don't need to read this. I don't expect you to read this, um, but there are lots and lots more best management practices that we didn't have in the toolkit seven or so years ago. Um, manure treatment, tree canopy, floating wetlands, for example. But we also know that we will have new challenges and, and challenges that we, we really can't, can't ignore. Science is telling us that we have additional loads coming from the Conowingo Dam. Uh, the, uh, uh, back when WIP-1 was developed, at that time, there was a sense that uh, the dam would continue to serve as one big BMP and, and trap pollutants uh, through the end of this effort, and it, it isn't the case. Uh, it is filled, and as a result, we anticipate or we know um, that we will need to address an additional 6 million pounds of nitrogen and 200,000 pounds of phosphorus. These are numbers that we hadn't anticipated having to deal with back in 2010. Climate change. Uh, there are lots and lots of very smart people who have been working on this through the midpoint assessment. And what we understand is that, that and, and maybe this is obvious, but now we, we have numbers um, to guide us, um, we understand that a changing climate is going to make our job harder. Um, more rain, more intense rain uh, means more loading to the bay. Um, and the estimates right now are 9 million pounds of nitrogen, more than we had anticipated, and almost 500,000 pounds of phosphorus. And th this, is, this is an issue that we, we simply cannot ignore. We ignore at our own peril. In, in my mind, this, this is the, the toughest part of WIP 3 and why it's n not going to be like WIP or can't be like WIP 1. Um, and that is that WIP 1 was largely point source driven. Uh, WIP 3 will be non-point source driven. And, and what you're seeing up here is a, an indication of where the reductions have come from, from 85 to 15. Uh, if you were in the boots on the ground session yesterday, Ann Swanson talked about this. Um, good, good work has happened. Um, the state working with wastewater treatment plan operators, um, most of our reductions in that time period have come from wastewater, and additionally, it's come from agriculture. Moving forward, um, we won't be able to rely on wastewater, and we know that uh, somewhere around 95% of our reductions will come from non-point source. So it's a finite list of wastewater treatment plants that took action to reduce nitrogen and phosphorus. Very finite list, you can count them, to almost an infinite list of non-point source needs. Um, in my mind, this is, this is the, the, the most significant challenge in, in front of us and why I need you to pay attention to that last slide. Um, and I'll, I'll offer that uh, we, are blessed with experience, uh, and we are fools if we don't use that experience as we, we put together this um, third phase of the WIP. Um, experience in this room, people who worked on tri tributary strat strategies over a decade ago and began to generate these ideas. Um, we've gone through the WIP one process, generated additional ideas, so we need to use that, that experience moving forward. When WIP 2 was completed, we had a Chesapeake Bay Stakeholders Assessment that was um, facilitated by the Institute for Environmental Negotiation, helping us understand better how to work with local communities. We know now um, from our experience uh, a, a better understanding of, of how, to, how to address co-benefits so we get um, a bigger bang for our buck. Uh, speaking of bucks, we have an idea of cost effectiveness now that we may not have had as much of back in WIP 1. Uh, so with all of that experience, and this is my slide attempting to show this, um, we literally know what we said we were going to do 
in 2010, and then what we've done up to now. So we can go back and, and determine what worked and, and what didn't work and, and where we need to fill those gaps. Um, so we, we would be foolish not to use that experience. And, and in particular, yesterday, you, some of you may have been in the presentation from James and Mark Bennett and Adrian talking about three decades worth of water quality data that will help us fine tune this effort. Uh, so, um, we also have our marching orders from the governor. Uh, you heard him make these remarks yesterday. Uh, there is a high expectation uh, that we will, um, we, we want to, we will be writing a phase three whip that provides us with assurance, provides us with assurance that we're gonna get the job done. It's not due until the end of June of next year, which seems like a long way off. Um, but I wake up in a panic and a sweat every morning thinking about um, what, what it is we have to do between now and then. Um, this is an indication of what is happening already. Uh, as you'll see through that timeline, we, this, this spring we are working on uh, with our partners um, in the Chesapeake Bay Program Partnership on the targets. We are developing a plan for reaching out to local decision makers that will involve the planning district commissions as well as the local soil and water conservation districts. Uh, there is a team of very smart people within, um, within the administration from DEQ, DCR, Department of Forestry, VDACs, VDOT, Department of Health, all meeting monthly to work on this effort. We have a Chesapeake Bay Stakeholders Advisory Group uh, meeting roughly every other month. Um, we are due to have a draft uh, to EPA by uh, roughly this time next year. And I'll end with my last slide. Uh, and I would hope that, um, as I said at the beginning, uh, we need new energy, new ideas, we need innovative thinking um, in order to get this done. That's my phone number, that's my email address. Um, let us know um, your ideas and, and become engaged in this effort. Um, thank you for allowing me to give this presentation. All right, so now we are going to get into the Q&A portion. Um, we took a little longer with the presentations than we budgeted for, so I prepared a set of questions. I'm probably only going to ask one and then kick it over to you guys because I'm sure you've been thinking up lots of questions for our wonderful esteemed panel. Um, so my, my question is a, a little bit of a softball, but it's not it's also a little tough at the same time. I know you guys have been thinking about it because the governor made a pretty significant announcement yesterday. So he announced that he has a goal of reaching 2% of general fund in terms of natural resource investments. Clyde, obviously, you talked about some of your constraints with state parks. David, you talked about the significant cuts um, that you've been incurring. Um, and obviously, we know about the significant needs in terms of meeting our Chesapeake Bay goals. So... And Joe, there are always resource constraints at the local government level. We talked about tax credits and, and how that may further drive some additional resource reductions. I'd love to hear from you in terms of just what you're thinking. How could we begin to implement um, that drive toward greater resource expansion? You want to start? And you call that a softball. Yeah, you've been thinking about this for years. <laughs> we know this because 1973 was when you were hired. <laughs> Go ahead, Clyde. <laughs> Say, what was that last question? What was the question again? Well, how do we get there? I mean, how do we what, get what, there? What's your vision? And, and, and if you could reach that level, how would you, how would you implement it? Uh, well... Uh, my plan is to, um, with the EO, is to uh, uh, lay out um, all the opportunities and, um, and and what it would take to um, cost those, you know, a, a, a large sort of maybe multivariate chart of, you know, here's what you get for this, this amount of money. And then I think it's going to take working with... Uh, uh, the governor and the, and the public to, to set some priorities for how to do that. Uh, we, we could um, 
pretty easily consume that 2% on our own right away. I'm thinking Clyde might think he's got a part of that 2% too. Uh, so so I, I'm not too smart on the on the revenue side of things to, to know how we get to that point, but I, I do know that, um, you know, when governors put budgets together, they, um, they set priorities as well uh, with the revenue that they have available to them. Uh, and, um, and I'm absolutely convinced that this governor um, uh, considers natural resources to be a huge priority uh, when he goes about his budget pro setting process. So my goal uh, is to give him the uh, information uh, that he uh, can use for what he would get for uh, any uh, incremental increases that we get in revenue. Thank you for that softball, Angela. I really appreciate it. Uh, so one of the things I already mentioned in that we are required by the code to do an annual needs assessment uh, of what it would take for us to meet our goals. You saw 30%. And uh, for agricultural best management practices, we're at 32 million. Um, our, our needs assessment says we need 110 million. So there's a one place to start right there. And in order to do that, we need the infrastructure in place with our 47 soil and water conservation districts. Um, we've been working on a budget template process with them for about six, seven years now. And it, it, it demonstrates that they're 30% underfunded in order to meet what we're already asking them to do without us asking them to do more. And we're asking them to do more right now by participating in phase three WIP. Um, in terms of state parks, uh, again, I mentioned we have several things online that don't have operational funding. Uh, in addition to that, um, uh, many of the vacant positions we don't have funds for are within our state parks. Um, we have many cases where we have a bare minimum number of rangers dealing with very, very large crowds. Um, and so that certainly is an important step we need to address. In terms of our natural heritage program, Tom, I believe the number is about two and a half million dollars that we need uh, right out of the gate that we can justify to benchmark all of the work we have to do. And that's not mentioning some of the work we might have to do with some of these solar uh, farms uh, or whatever we're going to call them um, in terms of trying to help, uh, you know, and, and, and um, I will say this, um, we have spent hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of hours working on evaluation of pipeline projects. I can't imagine the numbers of hours your staff have, but our heritage folks particularly looking at protecting uh, the resources uh, within, the, within those types of linear uh, utility projects, and I'm sure there's going to be more to come in, in the coming years. Um, our Planning and Recreation Resources Division is probably one of the most woefully understaffed divisions because of the fact that, like you said, Dave, when we've lost positions to budget cuts in the past, we have not uh, been able to fill them. Our project managers and our design and construction unit that work in our state park projects, they're carrying an average of about 12 projects per person. And by comparison, I've checked with some of our peer agencies and found out that their project managers are carrying three or four projects. And, um, and that's where we can run into problems with, East Cap with building out a state park without having boots on the ground to oversee the contractors. I could keep going, but uh, I'll stop there. You want to weigh in? I'll just offer... Um, the last time Virginia inched up above 1% was during uh, the Warner administration when uh, there was a significant commitment to provide funding for local wastewater treatment facilities to upgrade, um, which is why we can say in 2017 that we're meeting our Bay goals. Eldon James um, with Rapping and River Basin Commission noted yesterday in a session that that's the sort of commitment we will need to address stormwater. So um, that was a significant uh, amount of money and it, and it inched us up closer to 2%. So I, I certainly would think that that needs to be on the table. You know, Angela, I, I may take a different tact on this in terms of maybe looking overall at how do you increase the pie of state revenue? Mm -hmm because that's really what we're talking about. And you know, some of the things that we struggle with at VACO is we have an antiquated tax structure. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I can talk about successes and failures from this last General Assembly on how we deal with these issues. You know, one success, albeit a minor one, was the General Assembly, and this is getting off of environment, it's going to transportation, they came up um, with a fix to what was a, a declining revenue source um, when they did the gasoline tax and they went to taxing it at the rack. They stabilized that, at the, and Clyde knows this pretty well, they stabilized that at the state level to say if the, you know, if the price of gasoline falls below this level, we'll still tax it at this level. Mm -hmm. But when they did it for Hampton Roads and Northern Virginia, they didn't do that. 
And it took several years till finally we got the message that this is money we're just, you know, leaving uh, aside. Um, one thing that, that VACO and VML were supportive of was modernizing our communication sales and use tax. And I know I'm getting off topic, but I think it's important to realize, you know, there's things that we could do to get the change out of the, the cushions. And, and on this one in particular, you know, as people are, are switching to prepaid phones, which are not taxed on the CSUT, that's a declining source of revenue. If they're switching to streaming services, they're not taxed where cable is, so it's a, it's a non-compete there. Um, and the General Assembly shot it down. They called it the Netflix tax, you know, and it was, uh, you know, a lot of rhetoric about it. Um, but really, it's, it's modernizing those, those revenues, and I think it, that's going to be really important um, moving forward is how do we as a commonwealth um, come up with this. And I, and I think another thing, too, is that sometimes we fail to see the value of the assets we have and how do we capitalize them. And I think, Claude, I really appreciate you talking about state parks because that was something that actually our members, I think because of some of the work that you all were doing, came to us and said, Vaco, you got to get behind this. And we got behind some of those budget amendments because, you know, Clinch River, that's an important economic driver down there. Um, one example that I give of kind of a, a lost one and, and I'm gonna get political here, but that's okay. Um, VACO opposed a bill this year to say that state and local right-of-ways um, cannot charge more than a certain amount for a wireless structure to go in the right-of-way. And I'll, I'll give you one of those, as they said, if it's a pole is up to 50 feet tall, you cannot charge more than 1,000 a year for that, whoever that carrier is, you know, whether it's Mobility, Verizon, AT&T. Well, you know, we started doing the research on this. Um, places like Boston, San Antonio, they're charging, just for the use of their pole to put an antenna on, they're charging $1,500 to $2,500 a year with escalators of 1.5% to 3%. And those contracts have term limits on them and can be renegotiated. Mm -hmm. And here, quite frankly, we think the state is not only giving away the right-of-way of an asset that's been billions to be funded, but is currently underfunded and not maintained to, it, to its best state, and then it's also dictating to the locals, if you own right away, you can only charge this amount. And I, I honestly think that's a huge mistake um, from a policy level. And you know, I'll get off my soapbox. I know I got off topic. But I, I think it's important for the environment, but all, all of the Commonwealth, for all the priorities that we have, that we start to look at these issues. No, I think it's a great perspective. All right, so we have about 20 minutes left. Um, I'm going to open up the floor to you guys and uh, these Panelists will answer your questions. And also, um, just so that you're paying attention up there, I expect at least one question from the balcony. OK. Uh, Kevin Burns, question for Joe. Joe, as you know, um, in other forms of development, it, it can happen that a would-be developer or represents himself as a developer and carries a project through rezoning and adds value to the land for potential development and then sells off that development right to somebody else. Um, can that scenario be occurred by rule process? Um, I would say yes, and it does. Uh, I give the example um, of the Acomac uh, farm. My understanding now is that the original developer of that, the Acomac, I say Acomac solar farm, I, I'm catching myself here. It's, it's a, it's a utility-scale solar installation. It's not a farm. Um, 80 megawatts, hundreds of acres. They've, I think they've actually sold that to the, the, the parent company for Dominion. Uh, so they've got that. Uh, another example um, is the largest one permitted to date under PBR is 100 megawatt, I think on 1,200 acres in Southampton County. And it was the same developer that did the Acomac site has now sold that to Dominion. Now, one of the, the good things about that is, and, and it's interesting that you mentioned that, because I'll talk about the process in Southampton. Because uh, I went down there and, and gave some kind of information to the Planning Commission as they were considering this. And the Planning Commission actually recommended five to do two to deny the project. But in the process of it going from the Planning Commission to the Board of Supervisors, um, it was learned that Dominion was going to take ownership of the project, which gave the Board of Supervisors some comfort level. And, and why it gave a comfort level is one of the big concerns, and I didn't touch on this, is what happens after 30 to 35 years and these things have run their useful life? Or what if an independent, you know, owner of this goes belly up? You know, what if 
you know, who knows what happens in energy markets. They change <laughs> pretty rapidly, as we've seen. And now you're stuck with these panels. You know, who's going to be there to, to decommission them? And in, in the case of having Dominion, I think everybody knows Dominion's here to stay. And so that gave them some, uh, some comfort level on that. I don't know if that answered your question. Okay. Other questions? No? None? Oh, okay. Good morning. I'm Jeanette Poole with Department of Conservation and Recreation. And my question is related more to the land use impacts with the solar of energy farms, I guess you if you will. I served uh, as a staff member on the panel, uh, on the committee that looked at the permit by rule process for solar. That was back in 2010. And when we did that work, I don't think anyone anticipated the size of uh, and the amount of land impacts that these things would have. Um, so when I'm hearing about this, this project out in Spotsylvania County, it's, and ECR is doing work to, as Clyde mentioned in his presentation, to look at what kinds of, of vegetation can be planted to uh, help stabilize the soil and, and, and eliminate runoff, reduce runoff. So my question is, there are a lot of overhead power lines that have huge right of you know, that go through that might be 150 feet and 200 feet wide in some places. Has anyone looked at whether solar could have linear, uh, a, a linear format rather than a big massive format and maybe make use of areas that are already impacted? Um, I'm just asking that question because I don't think it crossed anyone's mind at the time, but yeah, there are a lot of areas across Virginia that already have these large um, impacts of you know, linear impacts that maybe a, a different approach would be taken with some of the solar and things less impact. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll give it a shot just because, uh, I mean, I've been in this milieu now for, for a couple years now in, in talking to developers and also to Dominion on this. And, and I think on there, it's, I think some of the issues probably would be for the incumbent utilities with these these lines is it, it's linear so how much can they fit in you know by mile and then you still have to have that interconnection into the grid I think there's a lot of engineering hurdles there um, plus then there's also you know access you know how do you get to these things on a regular basis to to um, maintain them to see when they're out I think those are probably some of the issues but it's probably a good question for, for Dominion or, or PJM or, or you know, some of the regulators. Yeah, uh, thank you, Danette. Uh, the other, interestingly enough, the other day we were in our 24th floor office and I was sitting here looking across the city of Richmond at all of these rooftops as we were talking about a proposal to put a, a solar farm on a, a, a property with a conservation easement. And I thought, well, here's a great opportunity. Why don't all of these buildings have solar panels on top of them. And so I think that there is an opportunity for us to, to look at, uh, at less impactful ways that we can, I mean, you heard the governor yesterday, and we certainly are committed to moving forward with getting as much solar as we can in our portfolio of energy, um, because it is nice and clean, but just like every energy source, it seems to come with its challenges, some I'd never thought about before. Like, for example, the question is, uh, how much of impervious surface does a solar panel have if the surface, if the panel is not sitting on the ground and it's sitting on posts, uh, is it surface? Uh, so I'll let David deal with that one. But, uh, you know, we have had some properties that had conservation easements that put in a small, small scale solar and, you know, it was sort of said, okay. Um, and now we have uh, easements that want to put in, you know, 100, 150 acre solar. And I, I had one landowner say, well, you know, when my, I'm harvesting soybeans and, and, and corn and selling them, I'm harvesting the sun. So if I put solar panels out, I'm just harvesting solar panels. And plus, they're going to be temporary. And uh, this easement's perpetual. And, and, and again, as I mentioned earlier, we have easements that were written in the 70s and, and the, when we didn't even think about, you know, with these large scale solar panels. The final thing I'll say is I, I hope that the technology is going to get to the point where it does. How many uh, acres per megawatt did you say, Joe? I hope the technology is going to get there. Eight to 12. Yeah, eight to 12. I would hope that maybe these things can get smaller as the technology advances. So I'll, um, I'll provide a, a little bit of additional thought on that question, but also kind of I think the broader strategic question of siting and land use, um, I do a lot of work um, advising the governor on energy issues, and we do have significant energy policies, um, and we want to see more investment in solar resources. There are a variety of 
important benefits associated with carbon-free, emission-free resources. Um, David spoke about the um, rule that DEQ is moving forward with, developing a carbon mitigation plan, a carbon mitigation regulation that would um, hopefully incentivize more of those types of resources. The governor just signed a bill um, that um, deems 5,000 megawatts of solar and wind in the public interest. So we know that this is something that will be prioritized by this administration, and I'm sure by future administrations, because we see a lot of benefits of clean energy technologies. Um, at the same time, I think there really are important questions around land use and permitting. Um, part of that bill that I mentioned that, that deems 5,000 megawatts in the public interest, it does a whole lot of other things, but it also sets up a stakeholder process that will look at a variety of factors as it relates specifically to solar. Um, for example, power purchase agreements, financing mechanisms. You've got all these big um, tech companies that are coming in that have renewable energy procurement targets. So how do you increase offerings to them? But it also includes um, some land use issues and, and local government considerations associated with solar. So it's something that we'll be digging into. Um, I think we'll need a blend of the big utility scale solar facilities because the economics of those facilities right now are so strong. Um, but to Clyde's point, you know, the rooftop installations, more of the distributed solar, that's starting to emerge and the cost profile of those resources are coming down. So I think we'll see more of that in the future as well. And then hopefully we'll have more of a blend of these resources. But um, we're certainly, you know, if the PBRQ is any indication, um, we will certainly see more of these larger solar projects come down the pipeline and there will be more of kind of that headbutting between our state public policy goals associated with achieving more solar energy resources on the grid and you know the local government kind of zoning and tax credit um, concerns that they have associated with um, those resources. So definitely something for us to really dive into in more detail over the next year and hopefully come up with more policy and legislative fixes as this administration moves forward. I just wanted to add a, a couple things. Um, because of the size of these things, you'd mentioned you, you, know, you hadn't really considered to get that big. I know a couple years ago, I had reach, reached out to Nikki Robner with TNC because I was reading some of the literature on the internet of some research papers about some of these larger installations in the West and having an effect on migratory birds. And the way I understood this paper was that when you have so many panels together and the reflection, it, it, they, I guess they called it the lake effect. And so migratory birds thinks it's some water and comes down and gets hurt in the process. At the time, I don't think uh, TNC, they, they went to their biologists and they said, well, at this size in Virginia, it's probably not an issue. But now I think at the, the scale in Spotsylvania, that may be one that need to, needs to be revisited. Um, Clyde, I like your, your comment about what, the existing pervious and rooftops. And, and one thing I'll say about that is sometimes I think we get mesmerized by solar panels and photovoltaic, but you know, from an energy standpoint, the better use in some of our urban areas is to use that solar energy for heating our water. I remember years ago I was at a, a, at a meeting and there was a researcher there showing all the rooftops in downtown Blacksburg and saying, if we put solar panels on each of these, this is how much energy we, we produce. And I raised my hand in the back and I said, do you know how many of those buildings heat their water with electricity? No idea. Probably a lot of them do. I mean, if we're not heating them with gas, then maybe we should be using that solar energy for a much more efficient use. And, and in fact, some of the technologies now in solar, and Clyde touched on it, you know, using less land, they're looking at actually concentrating um, the, the rays and actually heating water for, for turbines. So that's another, another possibility moving forward. That's right. Um, hi, I'm <coughs> with the Virginia Conservation Network. Um, and Director Taylor, I won't put you on the spot about pipelines so that we can talk about it anytime. time. Um, I wanted to talk about the governor's um, two initiatives, and obviously Angela brought this up a little bit, but I'd love to talk about how <coughs> you all are thinking about engaging the conservation community in both of those, so it's interesting to hear some of the ideas around um, revenue, both from how do we get more revenue, um, how do we increase the pie, and also how do we get more of the pie, um, but then also particularly, um, uh, Director Pillar, looking at your agency, how are you thinking about, obviously, you know, many folks from our community are constantly working with your agency and looking at it from different perspectives. So, on um, both of those, I'd love to hear from the panelists about how you're 
thinking about engaging the um, conservation community as you're looking at these two initiatives? Uh, thanks. Um, I'd be happy to take a pipeline question if you like. Uh, <laughs> no. Um, so I, I assume you've had a chance to read the executive order right now, uh, by now. And, uh, you know, it, it's pretty sweeping uh, to look at um, all areas of our agency. Uh, uh, what are we not doing that we um, would do well to do? Uh, what, um, uh, maybe I'll digress and say, every time that um, I've gone through a, a budget cut, um, which is a couple of times now, the um, uh, the triage has been um, uh, what are we required by, required by law to do, uh, what should we do, and what's it what's nice to do, and I can tell you that after all all the years of budget cuts, we've you know we, we've run out of those first two, and and we're down to um, the last one. And um, I tell my uh, have been telling our staff for a while that. Uh, uh, that we're no longer doing more with less, we're now doing less with less, and we got to do the less smartly. So, um, and, and Jim Collins talks about make a stop doing less, so we've been making stop doing less so we can keep focusing on what's important. Well, uh, this is an opportunity, uh, in my view, to, to brainstorm. So how do we move back in the other direction, um, and how do we prioritize those things? So. Um, I'm not exactly sure what mechanisms we'll have to reach out to the conservation community as well as uh, other parts of the community, but I see this as a brainstorming exercise. And um, you heard the governor talk about um, his commitment to transparency. We certainly um, have that commitment as well. And so um, I, I don't know the mechanisms yet. Uh, I, I welcome in, any input that um, anyone from the conservation community wants to uh, um, wants to initiate uh, in what I'm calling, going to call this initial brainstorming exercise. What should we be doing? How do we prioritize it? Those kinds of things. Um, I, I'm thinking that we'll um, maybe set up some structures to, to deal with that as well. I'm not sure what those would uh, look like yet, so I'm, uh, it's a little early for me to, um, um, uh, to be able to define a specific structure, but, um, mm -hmm. uh, but we will have them. and. Um, uh, both formal and informal, and um, both to the regulated community, the conservation community, the local government community, and and so forth, so that uh, uh, so that everybody feels like they're involved in some way in uh, helping us to uh, not only identify uh, but also uh, to prioritize. Because in my um, earlier answer to the softball question. Um, you know, I, the governor, I think, is going to have to um, look at what, you know, what matters to him uh, in, in all of this as, as he sets forth priorities and in, in putting a budget together. And, and I'm hopeful um, <laughs> that it can be, um, you know, not everything at once, but he, we got um, um, almost four more years, certainly three more years of budgets uh, that this governor will be involved in. And, and maybe it can be um, a growing and continuing continuing exercise in that way. So you want to add to that? Add from the um, perspective of, of WIP3, um, and I'd offer that uh, I was part of the conservation community when the first WIP was developed and certainly think that there's a significant role for conservation organizations to play. And um, have some thoughts, and I'll, I'll share those and would welcome further conversations. I talked about the, the information we have available to us now, and um, I think it gives us an opportunity to develop uh, local success stories that will help to engage the general public and um, certainly help to encourage and engage local officials. We will have training uh, on our tools in June. I'm looking at James to, if he can nod his head. <laughs> um, that'll be, that'll be uh, initially open to uh, PDC staff in particular, uh, but it can be open to others as well. And it would be useful, I think, for all of us to see this together. So we're, uh, uh, we're, we're all understanding how to interpret the data together. Um, 
I would also say that the local conservation organizations certainly have uh, great ties with their local decision makers, so that's certainly, there's an opportunity to encourage them to be part of this process. Uh, we, we're we certainly hearing that um, where you don't have a permit, uh, if you're uh, um, a rural community that, that isn't necessarily under, under DEQ's watch, there's questions about wh why you would want to participate. And so building those local success stories and then tying in the co-benefits, um, helping, hopefully helping local officials understand that um, doing work to restore the bay can also have benefit in their local community, whether it's flood control or improving their local streams or, or what have you. Um, I think the conservation community can help us, help us get that message out. Uh, and I, you know, s certainly um, as we go to the General Assembly uh, to build these resources that we will identify that we need, uh, there's, there's a role there as well. But um, those are just some thoughts here and I'm happy to continue that conversation. All right, any more questions? I still, oh, there's my balcony question. <laughs> I knew we'd get one. Hi. Um, my name is Lynn Crawford. I work for ACR, and I'm really curious about um, both the alternative energy question and also some of the conservation questions relative to the Bay. There's no conversation about scenic resources, their benefits, their attributes, and those kinds of things. And if tourism, ag, and forestry, which all contribute, that uh, tourism is, you know, 87% Um, why we aren't talking about that as a common resource in state. Well, I will say this, actually, before Clyde starts. Um, I know that we will be making some announcements in a couple of weeks at the vault conference, and so I think that you'll see some of those components built into our land conservation goals going forward, and maybe Clyde can build off that a little bit. But. Yes, sure, absolutely. Thank you. Nice. Uh, that's a good segue. Thank you, Angela. And thanks for that question. It's good to see you up there, Lynn. He's got his sunglasses um, back on. These lights are really, really They really bright. are bright. Uh, so uh, I, I don't think that uh, any of us want to, to skip over that very important part. Uh, it, it might uh, uh, point out about legislation in the General Assembly this year regarding the Scenic Rivers Program because um, we need to keep working on educating both the public and members of the General Assembly about the importance of what our scenic rivers and scenic byways and highways programs are all about and the importance of them. And Delegate Oroch had legislation this year that was, uh, well, two years ago, we actually had a scenic rivers designation bill fail in the General Assembly for the first time. It didn't fail. It got pulled before it got killed, but um, on a section of the York River. And it was all about politics, but more so about misunderstanding of what the, somehow there's a feel, a concern that these scenic designations are taking away some riparian rights or some private uh, property ownership rights and so we need to work hard to get that word out and educate people that that's not what it's about we need to do more of what we did when we did the James River uh, the uh, when we signed the, the bill signing with the James River designation and we had uh, local tourism folks and we had local outfitters and we had people on the water getting getting out on a raft and 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 talking to the outfitter and about how much his business has increased and how many how much of that increase has come from out of state because of the scenic river designation now on his literature, and so that's op definitely an opportunity that we need to continue to move the dialogue and the discussion forward and, and, and look at ways we can, uh, you might recall, and Lynn, I know you know well, we used to have a, we used to have a, spe a, a separate body uh, for the Scenic Rivers Program that now got merged under the, uh, under the Board of Conservation and Recreation as part of budget cuts a years, years ago. So that's just another example of something that got cut during hard times is probably one of those things that fell in the need to do, nice to do category versus I've got to do so. Well, great. Well, thanks to all of you for staying with us. This is our last panel, so we've made it. Um, join me in thanking our wonderful panelists for their incredible remarks today. <laughs>